First of all, we want to welcome our God-anointed speakers, Sadhu Sundar Silvaraj, Pastor Joseph Sweet, and his wife, Pastor Melinda. God bless you. God bless you. And all the pastors from all over the world, we want to thank you. God bless you. And for everybody who is here tonight, we will show the statistics. I just want to cut short as quick and so that we want to have maximum time with the servants of God. Amen. But I want to share with you one scripture from Romans chapter 1, verse 11. This is Paul. He said, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. He said, I long to impart, and, and you find Paul all the time using this word, I long to impart to you. Amen. Throughout a couple of weeks, we have been receiving phone calls in our, to our office. Um, if I come to the conference, will Brother Sadhu lay hands and pray on me? We wanted to charge extra for that, but... Uh, <laughs> but that's good, that's great. But this is what I want to challenge you regarding the scripture. When the anointed speakers lay hands, which is important, I long for it as well. But the laying of hands probably is only going to last five to ten seconds, isn't it? They will touch and they'll walk away. And if they stop and give you a word, which is probably one to two minutes, People will envy you. Wow. If not, it's going to be touch, 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 and they'll keep going. Are you following? It's going to last a few seconds. But the impartation of the Spirit as they are teaching is going to last for hours coming into you. And you are being bathed as their Spirit is doing the talking. Are, are you listening? You see, the anointing of impartation is greater than just the laying of hands. I want you to understand that. Laying of hands is as we start in God. We need the touch. We need the boost. We all go through that. But the impartation anointing is for sons and for daughters. Amen. It brings us into maturity. It gives us an opportunity to take it by ourselves as the word is coming forward. Therefore, it's a greater anointing. And Paul said that. Let me come to you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift. Amen. It could be through laying of hands, but it only lasts for a while. But the teaching, it lasts for hours as you are hearing the word, as your spirit is being ministered, it's being strengthened, it's being encouraged. God speaks to you. The servant of God ministers you through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you inside. You are taking notes from two people. Are you listening? The Spirit of God deals right inside. And that's an important cue in prophetic meetings. I want to tell you that. That's what apostolic fathers do. They impart. The impartation starts from the time the worship starts. Are you following so if you are waiting right to the end of the day or the conference where they will touch, that's when I'm waiting for, you lose the whole deal. Because that's like almost the topping up of the ice cream when the whole deal is preparing our hearts and our soul. So if we will have the right attitude to receive the word and what God is speaking from morning right to the night sessions, God is going to remind all the promises He spoke to you. The anointings that is hiding inside is going to resurrect when you are into and meeting. Prophetic meetings should not be centered on, I give you a little bit of a prophecy. It is not that two seconds word of five seconds, I know, I believe it, we do it. But we forget the prophets and the apostles, when they speak, the whole message is a prophecy to what God wants to speak to you. Amen. Amen. It is anchored in the scriptures. It is anchored in the spirit of God. Not just that moment, few words. Because all the time you say, God, what are you saying to me? But sometimes God wants to speak 
to us. Are you following? To us as one family in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we come for the worship. Well, that's a great worship. That's a great worship team. But God is looking for a time where we will say, this is a great worshiping community. It's not just the team. Because God did not just come for them. He said he came for all of us who can worship in spirit and in truth. Amen. And so I pray that will be the tutorship of the Holy Spirit as we come together in the right frame and in the right mind. First of all, before saying anything more and introducing our first speaker for the day, would you put your hands together to give a very big God bless thank you for all the crew and the admin team who did a great, fantastic job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When they put together and they organize this whole deal and the two ministries are involved, the crew video and, and, it, and the name keeps going on later, we'll address the first speaker for the day that the Lord wants to minister to us is our, our brother, my brother. How's that? Nice to say that. <laughs> Not many often I get to say that, but our brother and my brother. Everybody know him. If you don't know him, something is really wrong. More so than doing just a prophetic work, he has been involved in apostolic ministry for many, many, many years. Where they do things which God, there is no uh, uh, precedence for, people have not done those kind of things. Where the Lord has been doing building, going there, starting, identifying strongholds and so on and so forth. And, and the list keeps going forward, forward, forward. Because when God is working in you, it doesn't stop. Amen. It's a great privilege for us to hear from him this morning. So would you uh, stand up with me, if we can do that, to honor uh, God's prophet, Sadhu Sundar Selvaraj. Good morning, everybody. Let's bow ahead for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, O Lord our God, for gathering all your dear children from far and near to this wonderful conference. You have gathered your people unto yourselves so that you may speak to them. Now I pray, Lord, open our hearts, open our ears, that we may hear what the Spirit of God is going to speak to us. Give us an understanding heart. Give us a listening ear. And give us a comprehending spirit. And I ask you, Spirit of the Living God, as all hearts have been prepared to hear you, that one more time, you will stretch out your blessing hands, Lord, and lay upon each and every one of your dear children right now. Everybody has so many needs, Lord. Physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever it is. I now pray that one touch from you will totally heal them in their spirit, soul and body. Many times our faith is so weak, Lord. And our eyesight, spiritual eyesight, is so dim, if not blind, that we are not able to see beyond our natural unto the supernatural. We talk faith, but we really do not know how to lay on and take hold of faith. We really do not know how to step out in faith. So we come to you crying like a little baby for help. 
and i ask you lord because your holy word says you are a gracious god you are a good god you are full of tender loving kindness and your long suffering is no end so now i ask you help us lord help us help us to grow unto the full stature of the lord jesus christ for that is your will that we come to the full maturity that we do not remain babes any longer but we will leave we should leave away the foundational doctrines and go on to perfection that is your will that is why you have called your servant reverend dr steven francis to organize this wonderful conference so that you can speak to your people for such a time as this in which we are living in this last days thank you wonderful lord jesus for your gracious presence in our midst right now now i ask you lord speak forth that your servants may hear in the name of our lord jesus christ we pray amen, amen. please be seated everybody once again a wonderful very good morning to all you wonderful saints from around the world i am sure you all are well and good except for some very serious looking faces <laughs> you know one of the greatest blessings that we should uh, consider is to rejoice in the presence of the lord amen the scripture says very clearly when you enter into the house of god enter with joy enter with praise if you don't enter you don't get your blessing if you enter with a sulky face look around you you'll find some sulky faces now <laughs> so if you enter into a with a sulky face then what do you get good measure pressed down shaken over flowing over sulky faces right but the bible tells us very clearly that we should enter into the house of god with joy joy because god is going to come and meet you joy because god is going to speak to you so that should be full of joy and not any sulkiness amen since you believe that do you yes. give me one big smile wow look at that a great miracle has just happened all sulkiness disappeared once again uh, i want to thank our dear pastor reverend dr steven francis for his kindness to invite me to speak at this wonderful conference and uh, this conference i understand he has been holding for many years and god has raised him up to speak to the nation and uh, so it is the desire of god to speak because we don't serve a god who cannot speak amen the the lord god that we are following that we have accepted we call him the living god but what good is a living god who cannot speak who cannot hear who cannot talk or whom you cannot see or whom you cannot talk to or whom you cannot relate to what good is he because before i became a christian i was hindu in hindu theology we have millions of gods and every dutiful hindu or a buddhist or whichever other faith that we belong to we are taught to reverence 
the idol that is before us. During my ministry in Tibet, I once saw a mother. I was in this city called Shigatse. Shigatse is the second largest city in Tibet. And there is a very important holy monastery called Tashi Limpo. So while I was in that monastery, I chanced upon a woman and she brought her newborn baby with her to pray in the temple. So in the temple there are hundreds of rooms and these hundreds of rooms are dedicated to each manifestation of the various characters of Buddha or in Hindu, uh, in Tibetan mythology, not mythology, in Tibetan Buddhism, they have, they worship a different brand of Buddhism called Tantric Buddhism. So in Tantric Buddhism, it's a mixture of Buddhism and ancient Tibetan religion called Bon, B-O-N. So they just mixed the two and they came up with their own brand of Buddhism called Tantric Buddhism, which has a mixture of magic, mystery, and religion. So in this, in this uh, tantric Buddhism, there's also the worship of demons and uh, various uh, deities, various kinds of spirits, and including the worship of Buddha. So in this particular temple, there, there was this very important statue. So in the Tibetan Buddhism, this is only uh, special for Tibetan Buddhism, but not for general Buddhism. They have a godman, like the Catholics have the Pope, and they have a godman called the Dalai Lama. Have you heard of the Dalai Lama? He's a very famous political figure today. So the Dalai Lama status is very similar to the Pope. The Pope is a religious leader as well as a political leader. So the Dalai Lama is like that. He's a spiritual leader as well as a political leader. So every country has a president and then they have a prime minister. Similarly, in Tibetan uh, Buddhism or in the administrative political structure of Tibet, there is the Dalai Lama and the number two person, like a prime minister, you, he is called the Panchen Lama. So the Panchen Lama and the Dalai Lama are uh, hereditary titles that are passed down from one monk to another monk through a series of what they call reincarnation. So, Shigatse is the seat of the Panchen Lama, very highly revered, revered monk like the Dalai Lama, but second in rank and status. Now, when the Panchen Lama dies, most of the time, according to Tibetan uh, Buddhism, now, by the way, I'm not giving you a lecture on Tibetan Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't be mistaken that today you're going to study about <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism 101. <laughs> I'm just bringing a point across, so to just give you some uh, background information about all this. So when a high-ranking lama, a monk, dies, their, their bodies are usually embalmed and most often it is never cremated, but just kept for, for, for preservation. So in this Shigatse, in the very center of the temple, is a golden glass uh, structure in which is kept the embalmed body of the Panchen Lama. So the body is still inside and they embalm it around and made a statue of him. And the Tibetan people come to pay their respects as well as pray to him. So this is the background. So one day I was there and I noticed this young woman with a newborn baby. You see the baby, you can know whether it's newborn or oldborn, right? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Don't you know the difference? <laughs> newborn, oldborn? All of you are oldborn. 
So this is newborn. And, uh, and the, sh the mother had cuddled the baby so much so it looked like an Eskimo because of the temperature and the climate in Tibet, you know. So they cuddled the baby and uh, around the perimeter of that main uh, center, there are many, many Tibetan scriptures all encased in the wall. Hundreds of script scrolls, they're all put along the wall. And to prevent people from coming near to the center of the structure, there is a gateway. So a gateway, wooden gateway, all along the perimeter of the wall, bookcases, directing the pilgrims to go in a, a, count, a clockwise direction. So this woman, with, she went down, she went around the clock in clockwise direction, bowing very low, so that her head touches the scrolls, like bowing down to kiss and pay respects to the scrolls. So as she was doing, I also noticed she took her baby and made the baby bow down to touch and pay respects to the scroll. So I stood in a corner and I noticed this. The amount of fervor not only the woman has as a Buddhist, but also she was teaching her baby who does not know anything how to rever, honor spiritual things. Let me repeat again. From baby, the mother taught the baby how to honor, how to rever and pay respects to spiritual things. When I stood there and I saw that, two things strike me. Number one, how much do I rever and honor the living God? First, I looked at myself. If, if we claim that this Jesus Christ is the only true living God and there's no other God beside him, we claim that and we believe that, don't we? Then how much more do I rever, honor this living God? So I stood there for a long time trying to introspect into me to see if I can answer that question. How much am I doing it? So after I found the answer to that question, I move on to the next question. The next question was, how much do Christian parents teach their children from babyhood the fear of God, the importance of God? How much do we do? The amount of importance that we give to education, teaching our children which they, sh they should never ever skip school. But when it comes to church matters, we say you, church can be skipped. You know, have you ever realized when you skip church, you are teaching your children it's okay to skip church. For any kind of mundane, silly reasons, you decide not to go to church today. Ah, no need to go today. Can watch online. You know that attitude. Technology is good, you know. Right now, this conference is televised live on all Angel TV's 12 channels around the world. Technology is good, but it also brings into us a very callous 
attitude e reverent attitude towards the living god we consider him cheap if not today if i don't go to church today they i can watch online why go why go why beat the traffic you get stuck in the traffic i got stuck in the traffic this morning and pastor francis was so wondering what happened to me so he had to call where are you now right in the tunnel <laughs> i have to say i'm in the tunnel just this morning i meditated about jonah <laughs> jonah was in the belly of the fish i was in the belly of the tunnel same experience so how much do we reverence god how much do we teach our children the fear of god that no matter what happens god is supreme how much are we teaching them how much are we preparing the next generation for the end times how much are we doing that or are we just simply entertaining church very sadly church today has become a community center of activities social clubs you go to a social club there is drinking feasting there's a band that plays and then there's so many activities there's one corner you can throw darts in another corner you can play cards sadly church has become exactly like that you rush through a multiple church service everything is orchestrated to the right dot right one and a half hours everything must finish because the next congregation is waiting to move in so which means there is no room for god to for you to wait on god to listen to god no room no place we go through a motion of activity is that what church should be a club so every everything sadly becomes a form of entertainment of force feeding if you, if you get admitted in a hospital the doctor comes to see you right and then he pres- prescribes medicine and the dutiful nurses very dedicated nurses round the clock they come and check your blood pressure whether even though your pressure is normal they must come and check check your blood pressure check your pulse make sure that everything is okay even though it is certified okay they still have to check and then they come dutifully give you medicine in the morning and in the night and if the doctor wants you to be injected they come and give you nice long injection and they will tell you look up look down look left look right while you are busy looking they inject and they say bye see church has become like that everything regimented to the right t is that what it is why are we here what's the purpose we are here a month ago i was seeking the lord about this conference not the theme of the conference but what i should speak what god wants me to speak in this conference and as i was praying the lord showed me a vision of a scene that is that you will find in exodus chapter 19 the scene in exodus 19 is the whole congregation of israel about 3 million people they were settled 
camped before Mount Sinai. And God is now going to come down on Mount Sinai to talk to the three million people. That is the scene that I was shown. And the Lord showed me, he said, look at this scene. What do you see in this scene? Or what happens in this scene? In this scene, the Lord God told the prophet Moses, I want to speak to the people. So after three days of preparation, the people were gathered before Mount Sinai, and through a series of great supernatural manifestations, every one of the three million Israelites, young and old, heard with their audible ears the voice of God speaking to them. This is what we see there. And from then onwards, the purpose of God was to speak to his people and to prepare the people to inherit the promised land. So let's suppose like this. This wonderful saints who are seated here, you all are very good, aren't you? But you all look too serious. <laughs> so I'm going to put you all in Egypt. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let's suppose this, this is the place where Egypt is. And from the beginning, but you're not bad. Okay? I'm going to take you on a journey. All right? So let's suppose the beginning of this stage is the wilderness journey. And the walk in the wilderness journey is not forever because sooner or later you'll come to the end. And let's suppose all these wonderful saints, all the smiling ones, diamond is there, silver is here, ruby is here, rayma is here, Indonesia is here, all the wonderful sea, all the smiling saints are here. So I'm going to put you here as Canaan land. Ah, see? So that leaves the two of you in a limbo. <laughs> and what about the top? Don't worry, you are in the third heaven. <laughs> Amen. So you are in a very blessed position. Okay, now let's come back to this scenario now. This journey, while the children of Israel were in Egypt, we do not know how long was that time period. Because when you read in the Bible, you read chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And we like to presume that because we are taught in school, one is followed by two. Two followed by three. Have you learned like that? Okay, if you have learned like that, it means we went through the same educational system. <laughs> However, I want to tell you something. That is not how it is in the Bible. In the Bible, two does not necessarily follow after one. Perhaps four may come after one. They were written in that sequence. They were not written in a sequential order. So if you look for a methodical sequential order, you will be wrong. This is the problem with theologians. The interpretation of scripture where we go wrong because we always think, okay, chapter 1, after that must be chapter 2. So all the events in chapter 2 follow after chapter 1. No. No. Especially the book of Revelation, chapter 11, 12, 13, takes place simultaneously at the same time. But if you think, oh no, chapter 12 events must come only after chapter 11, you are wrong. Your interpretation is wrong. So, 
Now let's come back here. So in book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were in Egypt. And in Egypt, how did they saw God? They had a wow experience with God. W-O-W. Wow! Wow! Okay. <laughs> wow! Yes, good. It was a wow experience. Why wow experience? Because they saw the supernatural acts of God in display. So all during the journey, from chapter 4 right up to chapter 14, it was a wow experience. Wow experience. Till they came out of Egypt. Every day, they were experiencing the supernatural power of God in their lives. Always instant answer to every prayer they prayed. Sounds familiar? Wow experience. Now, after the wow experience, now all of you wonderful saints, you're no more in Egypt. I'm taking you by the steps. See? Now you are walking with me. Now we, are, we have put the first step in the wilderness. Now, this is where we are today. In the wilderness. In the wilderness, it begins from chapter, Exodus chapter 16. As soon as they cross the Red Sea, the experience begins there. From then onwards, till they reach the promised land, it is no more a wow experience. No more. No more. Rather, it becomes an instructive experience. Instructive. And a preparation experience. Because your life in the wilderness is not going to last forever. The life in the wilderness is not your real home. This is just temporary. Your home here is temporary. You're journeying from there in the wilderness. All your life is a preparation to enter into the promised land. Your goal should be the promised land and not to dwell in the wilderness. This is not real. The life that you are living now is not real. It's a preparation. A preparation to inherit the promised land. To inherit the kingdom of heaven. And to inherit this earth made new. Earth 2.0 made new. That's, the, that's your preparation. So your whole life, from the day you were born till the day you die, some who have greater faith don't die. They live forever. They cross over into the millennium. So those who have greater faith, you cross over. And I have good news for you. This last generation, whether you have greater faith or no faith, you will cross over. <laughs> you will live forever in a sense that either forever for good or forever for bad either one so this is where we are now in this period of where we are from Exodus chapter 16 right up to the end of the book of Deuteronomy if you read them very carefully, you will, very, you will find very, very less wow experience. But more of instruction. More of preparation to enter into the promised land. The goal is the promised land. The goal is not 
your target your sight is not the wilderness where else the attitude of the people were to make the wilderness their permanent dwelling place that is the reason why they kept on asking god we want onion we want garlic to make naan garlic naan <laughs> did, you, did you ever realize that see with the with the manna that fell they were making pancakes right so why they were asking for garlic because they all like garlic naan or garlic bread so they want garlic they want naan onion they wanted all this but they forgot one thing god was giving them better food manna and we read in the scriptures for 40 years god rained down manna from beginning of chapter 16 in exodus he rained down manna day and night so the biblical met- mode of eating is twice a day not like asians 24 7 we we practically live for eating we don't eat to live you know we live for eating in india whenever a guest comes the first thing we ask them let's have a cup of tea and we practically drink hundreds of cups of tea each day and we never get tired of drinking tea and the first thing when a guest comes to your house the first question we ask them before we ask them how are you is have you eaten that's the first question have you eaten and obviously the answer will be yes never mind come let's eat again <laughs> that is the oriental hospitality am i right even right up to the middle east this is the oriental middle eastern culture first you eat then we kill you <laughs> i mean not really kill you first we eat then we talk so god gave them manna and we read in the scriptures that when they ate the manna for 40 long years none of them okay please listen carefully except for the brief period of time where god disciplined them and many died in the wilderness because of sin except for those rare instances besides that none of them actually died none of them died why because they were eating manna the manna which the bible calls in psalms chapter 78 angels food food that angels eat so the manna is not just a frost a bread made of coriander that comes came down from heaven it is the very food that angels in heaven were eating now that brings us to our next question we read in the scripture in revelation chapter 21 verse 4 there's no hunger there's no pain there's no disease there's no nothing in heaven so why eat right why there's no hunger why eat so this must be something strange and let me explain to you what the scripture really meant where we all have wrong understanding of the scriptures or at least spiritual realities when do you eat you mean you don't eat at all the way that you all are so silent tells me the word eat is a very strange idea to you <laughs> do you eat yes. you do okay when do you eat okay now i understand why you all are uh, look strange because you eat all the time <laughs> okay normal people okay normal people asians are abnormal it's okay normal people when do they eat when we are hungry so when we are hungry normal people eat right so when the scripture says 
they shall not hunger it may it meant there is abundance of food supplies in heaven that you eat all the time and you don't have to feel hungry at all that's what the scripture meant i know this now from spiritual experience what the realities of heaven and then what the scripture really meant in the past before i had spiritual experiences and encounters i used to think oh no one feels hungry at all in heaven then that brings a conflict with other scriptures like manna angels food this manna came from heaven and angels eat the food if there's no hunger in heaven why is it or how is it that the angels are eating food so now to our natural understanding we only eat because we are hungry so does it mean angels are hungry question mark okay let's go to another scripture revelation chapter 21 verse 2 and 3 and you read that there was a tree of life which brought forth 12 kinds of fruits every month and which is for eating even the leaves on the tree of life is for eating and when you eat that leaf it brings healing to you okay this is another problem because revelation 21 verse 4 says there's no sickness in heaven right if there's no sickness why do you want to eat the leaf for healing problem isn't it it appears problematic because we are looking from our finite earthly point of view if you look at the earthly point of view with our earthly understanding that we only eat because we are hungry we only take medicine because we need healing then everything will look problematic but that's not exactly what things in heaven really are they are for different purposes let me give you one example in the year 1994 the holy spirit called me to fast and pray for 3 days on the third day while i was worshiping the lord that particular day i felt an unusual uh, urge to just spend the whole morning worshiping the lord after an hour of worshiping an angel a very very special looking angel appeared before me and he had a silver plate in his hand and i saw on the plate four kinds of fruits and they were all cut in very nicely in a shape one of them i recognize as a papaya cut in a shape triangular shape and the other i recognize as black currant four pieces of black currant and there were two other fruits which i have forgotten right now and his angel looked at me and he said i have brought you these fruits from the tree of wisdom so the moment he said that my my natural instinct was a hey, this is not right because we only have heard of the tree of life am i right where is it written in the bible about tree of wisdom the other tree that you read in the bible is tree of knowledge of good and evil but the bible does not talk about tree of wisdom at all so this cannot be a true angel so i took one step backwards so that i can have all the force to shout be gone satan <laughs> goes when you're near the force is not very powerful so i need to take a step backwards so you can marshal all your energy with one boom that's what they do in kung fu you know <laughs> ah why they go backwards and then so they can come and jump pom <laughs> they must have all these sound effects to scare away the enemy you know but the enemy still stands there and they give you a shout anyway so i stood backwards and i prayed i asked the holy spirit is this angel truly from heaven so the angel said i mean the holy spirit told me i have sent him 
take and eat the fruit. But still I have one mental block. But where is it written in the Bible about tree of wisdom? Never. So I asked the Holy Spirit. I, mean, I, you know, I was just meekfully asking the Holy Spirit something which I didn't know. So I asked him, please tell me. I've never heard anything about a tree of wisdom. Then the Holy Spirit asked me, have you not read the Bible? Where it says in James chapter 1, the wisdom that comes from above. See, there's a wisdom that comes from above. It comes from God. And it is shaped in this fruit. Take it and eat it. So then I felt assured, okay, there is a wisdom that comes from above. And then I took and ate the fruit. It tasted similarly to the tastes that we have, what you will taste like a papaya, like a green, black currant and all that. But it was more of spiritual substances. There was a natural taste there and I was chewing the fruit, but as soon as it entered into me, just like how medicines diffuse into your body, those, those things diffused into my spirit realm, and then the angel disappeared. After the angel left, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me, and he said, I have come to teach you secrets of the universe. You know, for the past few days before that event, I was reading, I'm always fascinated by astronomy from small. So during my spare time, I read books about stars, galaxies, on astronomy, all that. And just about that time, one of the most famous astrophysicists in, in the world, called Stephen Hawking, has written a book called The Brief History of Time. So I bought that book just to read passion. No? And for the past few days before that, I was reading that book and found it very hard to understand. So the Lord said, let's go through that book, page by page, and I will show you where the scientists of the world are right and where they are wrong. And for the next three hours, the Lord went through page by page in that book, and he explained to me the mysteries of the universe from a scientific point of view, but at the same time, where scientists are wrong and where they are right. Some of the theories are wrong because those theories don't apply in the spiritual realm, in the universe that God had created. So after going through the whole thing, the Lord told me, you are able to comprehend whatever I spoke to you because you ate the fruit from the tree of wisdom. If not, you would not have been able to comprehend what I have just told you. So, the things of the spiritual realm are spiritual substances that impart into your spirit spiritual things, spiritual values. Now, in the same manner, we come back to the manna. The Bible tells us the angels excel in strength. They are great, mighty, and they excel in strength. So where did they get that strength from? From the manna, they have been eating every moment. Because we read in the book of Exodus and Numbers that the children of Israel ate manna and none of them were feeble. None of them were sick. None of them had any manner of weaknesses. The manna sustained them for 40 long years. See, this is God teaching you to climb up higher, to live at a higher realm. But what did the people do? One moment they go up, and the next moment they come down, they say, no, no, no. We don't want manna, we want garlic. We want onion. See, this is the picture the Lord showed me. The journey in the wilderness is a preparation to introduce them to a life of supernatural living in the promised land. So the entire journey in the wilderness were preparation. So sporadically, 
they were introduced to all these spiritual elements sp- supernatural elements spiritual elements to give them a taste of the life to live in the promised land however one moment they go up and then the next moment they come down has this be our spiritual life one moment we go up the next moment we come down and say no 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 lord i don't want you to speak to me directly i want a man of god to speak to me i don't want you to lay your hands on me i want a human hand to touch me and pray for me this is what we are doing in our christian life now god is bringing you to higher realm to higher to live by the spirit we reach there but we don't stay there we come down the next minute and we begin to live by the law of life and death instead of by the law of spirit and life now what we read in the book of exodus about the manna is the same concept the lord jesus christ now introduces to us true the communion in john chapter 6 he says he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood will never die i challenge you this morning at the beginning of this conference please meditate on that what did the lord jesus christ meant when he said he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will never die he will live forever and ever and what did he meant by that what is the flesh what is the blood we read in john chapter 13 that when he took the passover the bread and the wine he said this represents my flesh and this blood this wine represents my blood and the apostle paul carries this further in first corinthians chapter 11 to say if you eat if you partake the lord's body and his blood worthily now the key word there is worthily so which means you can partake it unworthily am i right it also means you can take it casually without giving importance to it without respecting it you can be so casual about it that it becomes a religious activity not an encounter now you take communion either every sunday in some churches or traditionally once a month so when you take it once a month 12 times a year this just another religious activity okay take the this represents that this represents that everybody drink together at the same time we just want to drink it and eat it so that we can live immediately but the scripture says he who partakes it worthily pay attention to the word worthily if you partake it worthily the apostle paul writes that you shall not die right you will not have sickness you will not be weak you will not die those three words are the exact same words experienced in the old testament when they ate the manna same exact thing now i show you another spiritual mystery you take the manna you take the lord's body now we put them together and we need to eat will now translate to another factor what do they really signify the fruit from the tree of life why did god prevented adam and eve from partaking fruit from the tree of life after they had sin 
why did he prevent them because the scripture says if they continue to partake it they will live forever in sin live forever and ever because it is the continual partaking of the fruit from the tree of life that keeps you living forever and ever and ever <coughs> what caused the death of adam and eve besides the spoken word of god that they will die is the prevention from eating the tree the fruit from the tree of life it is that fruit that gave them life so the moment they stop eating it they slowly began to decline decline in health decline in living so that which they lost now the lord jesus says i am the living bread i am the living bread he said not just the manna the manna is still now listen people manna is still a created thing is something got created right is created tree of life is something got created but he says i show you a better way i am the bread i am the bread i am the tree of life so that brings us now we have a plus b equals c a is manna b is the communion and c is the fruit from the tree of life but we don't stop at c i now show you something better what is something better higher higher than the c there is another factor that is higher than the c the higher than the c is what we experience before mount sinai 3 million people gathered before mount sinai and they heard the audible voice of god speaking to them they had a visionary experience they saw the glory of god they had a audible experience they heard the voice of god and they had a sensory experience because it brought a fear they experienced that the awesomeness the fear of god so they saw they heard and they felt three dimensional experience with god when this was going on i think every one of us here would be willing to give a million dollars to have that experience even if you don't have a million dollars all that you have or some you will keep for yourself am i right everybody we will want to give up pay anything for such a wonderful experience right but look at the reaction of the israelites in exodus chapter 20 we read they told the prophet moses oh moses this is too much for us we don't want to hear you talk to us we will hear from you but we don't want to hear directly from god they said we cannot bear this experience as a result god stop talking to them directly because they asked ma <laughs> right you ask you didn't want god to speak to you directly you wanted god to speak through a prophet speak through a apostle speak through an evangelist speak through a pastor speak through a teacher you wanted second hand sources you didn't want god to speak direct live telecast to you you don't want that you want second hand information so the lord stopped talking and he only spoke through the prophet moses okay this is part 1 now let's go back to another picture the picture the question i had now all this was revealed to me while the worship was going on this morning you know i saw this picture so i had a question in my heart 
if three million people could not stand the awesomeness of God, how is it that Moses stood calmly, patiently, and he could have such visionary experience? He never had a problem. Where else the rest had a problem? What's the difference? So as I was pondering this, a, question, a thought came in my heart. Could it be because... Okay, the thought that came to my heart was, they fasted for three days because they went through a three days of preparation. God told them that. That was the formula. Three days of fasting. Three days of preparing themselves. Three days of washing themselves clean. And then they appeared on the third day before God. With all that preparation, they could not receive it. What is the problem? How is it that Moses alone could stand before the holiness of God and he never had a problem? What is the difference? The difference is, I found the answer, which will be my next message tomorrow. <laughs> no, 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 I will give you the word, okay? I will not leave you, send you empty-handed. Because you may faint along the way. <laughs> I'll tell you one word, but we will meditate on this in detail in the next. The difference is one word, consecration. That's the only difference, consecration. The three days preparation, they were prepared for an experience. Where else the prophet Moses was consecrated for life. To dwell in the holy place. He was consecrated. These were not truly consecrated. They were just consecrated for season. Okay, when a conference like this, everybody fast and pray. Better don't get any scolding from the Lord. Get a good word from the Lord. They do, you know. Don't you do that? Okay, silence means you all are in agreement. If we do that, no, oh, babe, better clear up all our sins. Better confess every known sin, unknown sin. Lord, even those things that I don't remember, please forgive me. Don't you pray like that? See, some honest saints. I have done that in my younger days. So that when the man of God lays hands on you, oh, you get wonderful prophecies, you don't get blasted by God. <laughs> See, what is that? Seasonal consecration. Seasonal. That is not what God wants you to do anymore. So God spoke with them. The word that came out of the mouth of God were living words. Now, what happened in Mount Sinai? Now we translate it back, translate it thousands of years later into the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, we read of the encounter the Lord Jesus had with the devil. And the very first temptation that the devil leveled at the Lord Jesus was to appeal to his physical needs. Now, God sent me here this morning to you. I'm speaking to you and to also the rest of the world with this one word. The word is this. Look at the scenario in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the scripture says, at the end of the 40 days, he was hungry. So 40 days fasting finished. He was hungry now to feast. But before he can come out of the fast, before the prayer and say, Amen. Before you say the final Amen and the benediction is said, the tempter came into the picture. The first thing the tempter did was, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread so that you may eat because you are very hungry. You know, most of us, we look at this temptation when you focus on the part where the devil said, 
turn these stones to bread. But that is not the main thing, you know. The main thing is the first part where he said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, that is the first sentence that we all overlook. What was the devil trying to get at? Causing the Lord Jesus to doubt who he was. Doesn't he know that he is a son of God? He knows that because in Genesis, I mean in John, sorry, in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16, when he came out of the water, he together with John the Baptist heard the voice of the Father God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the Father God already addressed him who he is. Okay, but you may counter challenge me saying, okay, but that before he can even realize who he really was, he went to the wilderness to fast and pray. So probably he doesn't really know that he was a son of God. Okay, that argument is fair. But whether is it valid or not, let's consider another option. Now you, that event, baptism took place at 30 years old. Now we let's go back to time when the Lord Jesus was 12 years old. At 12 years old, his parents brought him to the temple for the bar mitzvah ceremony. And after the bar mitzvah ceremony, they all left to Nazareth and they realized that the Lord was not with them. You remember this story? Okay. So after three days of searching, they found him in the temple debating with all the learned scholars and Mary and Joseph asked him, what are you doing here? Don't you know you should be following us? And listen to the answer of the Lord Jesus. He said, I must be about my father's business. 12 year old boy saying, I must be about my father's business. Who was he referring to as father? God, right? So which means at that moment or before the age of 12, he already knew by revelation that he was the son of God. Am I right everybody? You follow this logical thing? So you imagine now, let's suppose this revelation came to him at 10 years old. This just suppose, it could be earlier. 10 years old, he knew he was a son of God. From 10 years old all the way right up to 30 years old, he has been continuing in the knowledge of who he was, the son of God. No doubt. No doubt. That is why he could say so forcefully, I must be about my father's business. He never had any doubt about his calling. But here comes the devil. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, causing him to doubt his calling, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. Come on, do a miracle to test and see whether you really have the calling. How does this translate to your everyday life? Many people have a call of God on their lives. Then comes the devil. Ashley, are you really sure you are called? Are you really sure you have a Singaporean wife? <laughs> are you sure you should go back to England? Are you sure? Look at you. <laughs> Your wife is Chinese, not Angmo. Are you sure? Are you really sure? This is a wonderful family from Pastor Stephen's church. See? Are you really sure? Do you, are you really called? This is the tool of the devil to cause you to doubt your calling. Are you really sure? Are you sure? If you pray, there will be a healing. Are you sure? Nowadays, we don't need the devil. We ourselves doubt us. <laughs> the devil can take a break. 
now there's a greater devil inside us. Right? We doubt our own giftings. We doubt our own authority. We doubt our own position in Christ. See, that is the same old tactic of the devil. Are you sure? Are you really sure? Point number one. Now point number two. Let's test. Let's test. Put a fleece. See, that's another thing. So whenever we do all this, what are we really doing? We are playing the devil's game. Now, uh, okay, some people can say, okay, Gideon put out a fleece. So you quote a biblical example to validate your experience. When Gideon put out a fleece, there was no precedence to him. Today you have a precedence, the word of God. And the Holy Spirit dwelling inside you, who's talking to you. So why do you need to put out a fleece like what Gideon did? You don't need to. But why do we do that? Because we are playing the devil's game. Because the devil told the Lord, come on, put out a fleece. Don't just stare at me. Put out a fleece. So the Lord was still staring just like how you are staring. <laughs> so the devil was tempting the Lord. Let's test it out. Put out a fleece. Turn the stones to bread. So now that brings us to another point. What was the devil really getting to? He was hungry, remember? So he said, feed yourself first. Take care of yourself. That brings us to a present problem in every Christian's life. We are making bread for ourselves. Bread should be to feed others, not to feed yourselves. How do you do that? By going to the meeting, asking for God, bless me. Give me a word, Lord. Give me a word. Bless me, bless me, bless me. That's what we are doing, flocking conferences after conferences. Why at the end of the day, you still go up to ask a prayer from the minister? Because you are making bread for yourselves. You should be making bread for others. Now, we will pause here and connect this to another story in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, a similar incident. Three days, at least 20,000 people were together with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then on the third day, he wanted to send them all away. But he said, okay, I don't want to send them hungry. Feed them. But they had no food. So a small boy with five loaves and two fishes came. Sorry, five fishes and two loaves. And the Lord took those two loaves of bread and he multiplied it to feed 20,000 people. Now, you consider this deeply. If the Lord can do this then, he could have done it in Matthew chapter 4. Right? He could have very well. He doesn't need the devil to tell him, no. He himself could have turned the stone to bread to eat for him. If he had done that, he would have broken a cardinal law which would have disqualified him from becoming the perfect lamb for our sacrifice. That act would be an act of self-dependence. Self-dependence. So he was going to do a miracle for himself. Whereas, if you look, read the entire Bible, in Acts chapter 10 verse 38, he went about doing good, setting others free. So the authority and your healings and your giftings are for a blessing of others. So you should not be a bun-eating, donut-eating person. Rather, you should be a bakery to feed others. That should be your main purpose. Feed others, not you feast yourselves. Self-dependence. So here, then, comes the third point. The Lord Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
Now, two things to look at this scripture. Number one, don't work your own miracle. Don't work your own way out. Don't figure out yourselves what to do, what not to do. Don't do that. Be dependent on God. Be reliant on God for your continual success. Why do we face failures in our lives? Because we are not dependent on God. We are of the opinion that we are the masters of our own universe. Recently, I had a talk with an anesthetologist, anesthetist. So the anesthetist explained to me there are two kinds of anesthetic they give. One is regional and the other is general. So I asked the anesthetist, what's the difference? So the anesthetist told me, regional means, let's say, suppose you are going to have an appendix operation, right? So the appendix is, they'll operate here. I had it done in 1975. Self-induced appendix. So they will put an injection, am I right, Dr. Lai, somewhere here to numb this region so that they'll just operate on you. But you are fully conscious. You are fully awake. You can even see the surgery. Okay, look down. Cut here. Okay, take it out. <laughs> or watch on a video screen. You are fully conscious. So this is regional anesthetics. The other one is called general. The general anesthetics will put you to a complete sleep. You are not conscious of anything, what's going on. After they operate, whether they take out your kidney, your stomach, you don't even know. <laughs> they put in plastic or put in football, you don't know. <laughs> you only come out of your anesthesis and then you find everything perfectly well and gone. Hallelujah. Right? So, I was curious about these two procedures. So I asked this anesthetist, okay, why do people want to opt for regional anesthesis when they can be fully sedated and they don't know what's happening and then after that, praise God, you come out, everything finished and done, right? So the anesthetist gave me a very beautiful answer. She said, now listen, this is, I don't know whether she's a Christian or not, I didn't ask her, but her answer gave me a spiritual perspective. She said, people want to be in control. They want to be in control of what's happening around them. They don't want to, they are scared to let go. You let go, you don't know what happened. Kidney go out, lungs go out, <laughs> football comes in, suddenly you come out of the hospital, you find yourself pregnant. They want to be in control. Isn't that what we do in our spiritual lives? We are scared to let go and let God lead. It's very scary because you don't know where the next step is going to be. You don't know. Every step that you take will be steps of faith. You don't, you, you don't have any, everything clearly spelled out before you. That is a life of faith that God is calling you to. In the journey in the wilderness, the people did not know where they were going. They did not know. Even the prophet Moses didn't know where they were going. There was no Google Maps, you know, or GPS to guide you, okay, this is the direction to go to Canaan land. You follow Google Maps, sometimes it takes you wrong direction. <laughs> I'm sure you've experienced that, right? So don't trust it all the time, right? So nothing was there except the presence of God in the form of color, cloud of pillar by day and a pillar of fire by night. That was the GPS that was guiding them. So they followed. Sometimes the cloud does not move for three days, three months. The longest was three years. For over a year, the cloud does not move. And the people just camp there, not knowing when the cloud will move. Anytime the cloud moves, they must immediately pack their tent and move. 
leading of the holy spirit scary but very adventurous because you live the higher life if god calls you leave all come follow me you know that is a very high call for god to say come follow me it's a very high noble call with that calling comes total provision god takes care of everything for you because you were willing to give up everything take up your cross and follow after him so when you do that god becomes your el shaddai jehovah jireh and the great i am that one i am consists of everything see you know i share with you one revelation about the word i am i am two letters right there can only be one i not two i god should be the only i in your lives your i should die can be only one i god say i am only i am not you so you don't say i am no more no more you must from now on you must say we because the lord is in you ma <laughs> so is you and him makes two right so if two simple english grammar what do you say we 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 are going never mind what the world thinks about you they may think you're cuckoo <laughs> one person is going how come you say we are going now let's ponder let's come back to the one word that i want to bring you up to the higher realm the higher sea the lord jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of god please let this word roll in your mind man shall not live by bread alone so for the first part of the bread refers to the natural bread so man shall not live by the natural bread but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god now the word so man shall live by the word of god now the word word the lord jesus said in john 6 i am the bread that came down from heaven so now you put this two t- together 1 plus 1 the word is the bread and the bread is the lord jesus and that word is the written word that we have does that mean if i meditate the word of god day and night day and night i don't need physical food anymore rema not so hit yes so from today onwards no more mcdonald ha <laughs> huh? no more hamburger i mean no more ah huh? ah uh. no more tago tago no more please meditate that this is what the lord told me to come and share with you said take them to show them the higher realm the higher the higher picture what i am calling them to where they should be men shall not live by bread alone the bread is also something that we are looking for through someone else come and lay your hands on me prophesy to me bread from a man i remember last uh, last year september when we were here for our moses 2 conference on the last day when i was uh, going to lay hands and pray for people and uh, there was a lady in the line that i asked her i she came back the third time so i asked her why should i what do you want she said whatever whatever so whatever means what tell me what whatever means nothing right whatever means nothing so i said lord i don't have anything <laughs> if god doesn't have anything i also do i do don't have anything right now man shall not live by bread alone 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the Lord Jesus said, if you can believe, if you can believe, the words that I speak to you, they are life. Life. And the Greek word for life is the zoe life. You all are very familiar with the word zoe. Of all the Greek words, most Christians are familiar with two words. Agape, zoe. Am I right everybody? See, zoe. Zoe is the more abundant divine life. You know, every time I partake the communion, I hold the emblems in my hand and I say, I believe with all my heart this bread is the flesh of the Lord Jesus and this cup is the blood of Jesus. I believe that with all my heart. And then after I partake it, I say, Lord, thank you for giving me fruit from the tree of life. Because the Lord showed me this revelation. And every day I confess this revelation. I have partaken fruit from the tree of life. That keeps you going on, on, on. God wants to speak to you directly. Prepare you. Prepare you for the end times, for the last days. Time will delay no longer. The wonderful privilege that we have in these peace times, gathering in a conference like this, this liberty we will lose very soon. We will lose very soon. We will be thrust out in the wilderness. Now which pastor is going to pray for you? Which pastor, which prophet is going to give you a word? See, prophet's conference. No prophet's conference. Who is going to do all that for you? If you don't train your spirit today to live in Christ, to abide in Christ, then you will be lost in the wilderness like the Israelites continually crying for garlic and onion and you will miss the manna that will come from heaven. You will miss it. It is the desire of God that you live a life in the tree of life. Eating, partaking the Lord Jesus. The word that you read, the Bible, don't look at it as the Bible. Don't look at it as page with ink. This is the very word that came out of the mouth of God. The moment you see like that, then the pages take on a new meaning. It takes on a new meaning because you're not just reading the scripture, you are meditating, feasting the scripture. When you feast the scripture, you are having a meal. If you have a meal, how can you feel hungry? You'll always feel full. Am I right, everybody? Yes. Amen. Amen. How many of you this morning believed every single word I spoke? Amen. Stand up to your feet. If you didn't believe, it's okay. You can sit down. Only stand if you believe every single word that I spoke. Deep break up for it. As you close your eyes, let's just humbly kneel down for a moment. For two minutes now, please recollect what you have just heard. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. I see right now the will mentioned in the book of Ezekiel in our midst. And I, and I perceive this will speaking to me, saying, 
tell the people that every word that will be spoken at this conference to every speaker it is god speaking giving the people words of direction words of confirmation for their lives at this conference some will receive direction for what they should do this relates specifically to direction in the ministry how you should conduct your ministry and in this conference also god is going to realign things in your life if you allow he will realign and the hand of the lord will also come to touch you and heal you if you be willing and obedient to seek the face of the living god during these days your spiritual eyes will be open to behold the glories of god you are your eyes will even be open to behold some special angels that have been appointed for this conference one particular angel i see right now standing on my right at the far end of this stage a special angel appointed for this conference learn to cast away the old in your life now i see this angel speaking these words now it is the will of god that every believer in this conference will cast away the old that they may put on the new as they will step out of this conference and god has prepared for them some new garments i see right now before the angel several sets of multi colored garments thank you wonderful lord jesus and there are many here similarly are seeking the face of god if you will sincerely seek the face of the living god during this conference days god will open the eyes of your understanding and the heart of your understanding and make his ways known to you thank you wonderful lord jesus please lift up your holy hands unto the living god let's bless the name of the lord our god he is our good god his grace and mercy endures forever and ever come on open your mouth and bless the name of the living god give thanks to god for he has done wonderful things this morning give thanks to god for he has shown you his ways give thanks to god for he has made his ways known to you let all that has breath bless the name of the living god father we worship you god father we pray that your word 
will become a living manna in our spirit that will feed us, strengthen us, remove all the spiritual diseases that is making us weak from our walk with God, that is making us decay in the things that they've called us to do, that is causing spiritual abortions in our life and in our ministry. Father, we pray that the manna of life will bring the everlasting wisdom and the life from heaven. We pray, God, once again, we will vote for the higher life that you have called us, O oh God. We will reject in Jesus' name all the temporal matters that the enemy tempts us with. Did God say this, that your family will be taken care? What will happen to your ministry? Today, in the name of Jesus, Lord, once again, we will become the sons of the living God. Lord, that we will reject in Jesus' name. We will dare to declare that my Father is faithful. We will dare to declare and bind the works of the enemy. That when God calls you, He provides for. He provides for our family. He provides. God, without asking for the works that have called to do, He looks after our needs and our concerns. He is never late to take care of the needs of His family. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to walk into that divine. Transit us. Translate us. I want to thank you. Honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.